there it is. The old engine is out. As you can imagine, that is the hardest part of the engine R&R process. I mean, think about it. You're dealing with gaskets there sticking, different components there sticking, fluids leaking everywhere, and then there's the rust, the darn rust. Especially if you live in the salt belt of America, these vehicles are 10 to 15 years old by now. Guess what? You're going to be fighting bolts all along the way, especially the engine mount bolts and nuts, the exhaust bolts. And then, you know, the other common area is the power steering pump bolts that like to seize and snap, uh, which happened on this one. So you just be ready for it. You're going to be fighting it all along the way. Now, at this point, with the engine out of the vehicle, what you want to do is put it on the ground on a rag just like this. It does help stabilize it, believe me. And then what you want to do is use a 4x4 block of wood and a 2x4 block of wood or 2x6 as you see here and put it under the front part of the pan. And that makes kind of like an engine stand and it'll make it really, really secure, okay? It'll be nice and steady and secure and safe while we're swapping over all these old external components from the old engine to the new engine, okay? So that looks a little something like this in the end, as complete as possible going back into the truck, okay? What I'm gonna do now is we're gonna go through the different components you wanna swap over to the new engine, and then we're gonna go through torque specs and what to look for if you are reusing the old components. As you can see, most of the pieces on here are new. I'll show you a diff couple different areas you wanna watch out for and how to do it right. Uh, so this engine lasts as long as possible inside and out. Okay, so the first thing I wanna talk about is the base remanufactured engine itself. You know, what comes in the black box from the engine rebuilder? Now, a company that I use is called Powertrain Products. They're based out of Maryland. And the reason why I use them is because I've had really good luck with them over the years. I've installed a bunch of their engines and a few of their transmissions, and I've had zero problems afterwards. That's huge. That's key with me to get the job done once and be done. It's good for me, and it's good for my customers. Not to mention, if a problem does arise down the road, these have a really good base warranty, and then you can also buy an extended warranty up to seven years no-fault warranty, which is incredible. Now, of course, all these engines include the upgrades to address the common issues in the 543 valve, the oiling issues. So it has the uh, melting oil pump inside, the cast iron chain tensioners, and it, the heads are line board, and then they add cam bearings in there to address the clearance issues in the heads, all relating back to the oiling issues. And most of these will include the Dorman XD phasers, which is a heavy duty new phasers that Dorman came out with about a year or two ago, uh, which are holding up much better than the original phaser. And then some of them will also include the Ford phaser. So it's just kind of a hit and miss thing. If you call in, maybe you can ask for it and try to get the Ford phasers, but the Dorman XD phasers are holding up as well. Now, one thing you need to realize is once you get the engine, it's gonna have uh, be fully complete, long block, timed, all ready to go, go valve train, you know, crankshaft, everything ready to go. You'll have the front cover on there already bolted on for sure. And you'll also have the engine oil pan bolted on. Now, the thing with the oil pan is that there's different variations of the oil pan up front here. There may be uh, indents in the front to accommodate the front axle on certain models. And then like this right here, uh, 04 and 05 models have an engine oil temp sensor. So you need to make sure the new pan matches your old one. If it doesn't, you simply clean up your old one and swap it over. Up top here, same thing, the valve covers. It may or may not come with valve covers on there. It depends on the manufacturer and the run that they're, they're doing. So again, if it doesn't have valve covers on there, simply swap yours over, clean them up, and new gaskets, bolt them on. Next, we'll go over all the old components that you need to swap over to your base core remanufactured engine and then how to torque them down and what to look for before transferring those old components over. Now comes the fun part, transferring all the old dirty pieces and cleaning them up and putting them onto the new engine so it looks just like this. What we're going to do is we're going to start off right here in the front. We'll go through everything in detail, give you torque specs, and they'll end in the rear. So the first thing you want to do is swap over your cam sensors, one on each side. Just hand tighten the bolts, put a little bit of grease in the O-ring, clean them up, and you can reuse them. I've never seen one of these fail. Same thing with the crank sensor. Now the pulleys are a different story up front here. These pulleys on the old engine, you want to take them, if you're reusing them, and spin them. Okay? 
They should be perfectly quiet. Like there's any kind of noise coming from them, a whining noise, a grinding noise, you want to change them out to new. And that's why I did on this one. They're so common to fail. I replaced all these pulleys on here. The torque spec on these is 18 foot pounds for all of these bolts. Okay. On here. Same thing with the water pump. Change it out to a brand new Ford water pump. Trust me, it'll be the last water pump you put in this engine. Torque specs on those bolts, same thing, 18 foot pounds. Just kind of jump around in a star pattern and that'll bolt up the new water pump on there. Now the crankshaft dampener down here is a different story. But what you want to do is tighten it all the way down with an impact until it fully seats, then back it off, torque it down to 37 foot pounds and then an additional 90 degrees. And that'll kind of torque to yield that bolt and hold it secure on there. Um, the oil filter adapter on the side here, you can see I'm using new on there. And the reason being is a lot of times, let me show you on the old one here, the, uh, the sealing ring on here will get pitted to the point where it's not safe, I guess you could say, to reuse it. And it can cause leakage issues. So on this one, just check yours carefully. Um, on this one, for my build, I went ahead and I replaced it. Either way, if you clean up the old one and reuse it, um, the gasket you want to use is a Ford gasket. There's a new metal gasket from Ford with the insert O-rings in there. And it's a much improved design over the old one to avoid oil filter adapter leaks, which are so common. Same thing with all the bolts on there. They're 18 foot pounds. Uh, just kind of jump around on there and torque it down. Of course, you want to put on a brand new oil filter. I recommend the Motorcraft one with the silicone valve in them. They're really good and they're really cheap. Um, up top here, like I said, if you don't have, if you need to swap over to valve covers, um, use a new gasket, make sure everything's clean. Use a, a dab of sealant right here and right here where the joints are at on there. And then you go ahead and torque them down. I'll put the torque spec in a sequence down below for both the new style you see here and the old style. Now the VCT Solite should already be in there. If not, make sure you put new ones in before putting the valve covers on, but they should be in there already um, and, and tighten those down. Same thing with spark plugs. Whenever you put in a new engine, you wanna use brand new spark plugs. Use the Ford ones, the Motorcraft ones. You won't be sorry. Those are the ones to get. Make sure you put a little bit of anti-seize in the tip and torque them down. The torque spec on these uh, older style ones are, is 25 foot pounds, okay? And I'll put the torque spec for the newer style. It's much lower um, on the newer engines. Exhaust manifolds. Exhaust manifolds are so common to rot out on these and the studs to break on these and that warps the very ends. It's best if you're this far in to put new Ford manifolds on the Ford right-hand manifold kit actually dropped in price quite a bit. So it's worth it to put it on here. As you see here, I have stainless uh, studs and nuts on here to avoid any kind of breakage in the future. So this will never happen again. No issues with the manifold again. And of course you definitely want to use the Ford gaskets. There's, there's a multi-layer steel gasket to avoid any kind of leaks in the future, cold or hot. Um, engine mounts down below here. Wait, we didn't go over a torque sequence on these. Don't want to forget that. It's very, very important, even though I have a detailed video on it. The studs on here, the new studs are torqued at 106 inch pounds. Then once those are on and the gaskets are on, the manifold, you slide that on and start the nuts on here. You torque these nuts to 18 foot pounds, top to bottom, top to bottom, top to bottom, from the back to the front, same thing on the other side. So it's very simple. Once you torque it down, you want to go through, again, top to bottom, starting in the rear here, and recheck that torque as the gasket on there settles, okay? The studs on here, the studs have a standoff on them from the factory. I've had leakage issues with those where the, the, the lower Y pipe cannot get up far enough to uh, uh, seal on this collector properly. So now I use these uh, straight studs like this with no standoffs, from Dorman and they work really well. I'll link to those down below too. Engine mounts, these are a toss up. They really, really are. Um, I, I'm keeping this vehicle, this vehicle's mine. I'm just starting, I just bought it. 
So guess what? It's you know 15 years old now. I'm putting in engine mounts. So it's up to you if you want to do engine mounts or not. The bolts on these are 50 foot pounds. So just there's three bolts on each side for each engine mount. They're 50 foot pounds. I do use a little bit of uh, blue Loctite on there. Um, going up here in the back, these are the basic gaskets that come with uh, the manifold or the uh, the engine. There'll be a thermostat, some O-rings, some gaskets, intake gaskets. It won't be a complete set. So open it up and see what you got and then see what else you need. Like I need water crossover gaskets and all that stuff. So these are never a complete set. Don't rely on the engine manufacturer to give you a full gasket set. Up top here, this engine did come with a new CHT sensor. Uh, you're probably, you're gonna have to swap that over for sure. Even if you reuse the old one, it's 89 inch pounds. And then make sure you put the little jumper on here and it's kind of put it back here, ready to uh, bolt on to the intake back there. Same thing with the knock sensors here. Um, these you want to take out of the old engine by hand. Do not use impact tools. And going back in, same thing by hand. Torque spec on these, again, is critical to make sure they work properly. That's 15 foot pounds. On the back side here, your new engine will include a nipple like this right here. This is a nipple coming out of the back side of the water pump. And it's gonna have two new orange O-rings on. Make sure it looks just like that, ready to go uh, for that, that pipe that goes in the back for the heater hose. Make sure it's all set and ready to go also. Um, over here, you know, same thing. You wanna make sure you put new manifolds on. Uh, yours is probably gonna be warped and rotted out really well. And it's a good time to use all those stainless studs so this never happens again with these, these exhaust manifolds, which are so common. Uh, same thing over here. 50 foot pounds for the engine mount. Now the dipstick tube on here, unless you live down south, there's no rust. This thing's gonna be stuck big time in the block over there on the old engine. It's best, it's like 15 bucks. Buy a new one, has a new O-ring built into it already. And then you can bolt it up over here, okay? That is the way to do it. Now these hoses, you wanna put on the lower radiator hose and the degas bottle hose that goes up to the degas bottle and have them clamped in all ready to go. It makes it really easy to put the engine back in that way. The way you do it is you line up either the line right here or the arrow with the, the casting line in the, um, the adapter. See that how they line up like that? And that makes sure the orientation going out like this and up is correct. And then you simply put the clamp on there just like that. Um, ba -ba 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 -bum. I think that is it. Um, that, that those are all the pieces you want to transfer over. Uh, so it gets to this point right here. You do everything while it's sitting here on the stand and it'll be a nice professional job in the end. So when we put it into the vehicle, we have no problems. Real quick, before installing a new engine into the vehicle, I want to go over a super important tip that's going to save you a real headache here in the near future. Now all these engines are shipped dry. No engine oil, no coolant, which is standard, it's fine. The problem with it though is that it creates huge air pockets within a cylinder block and a cylinder head. This can cause localized overheating while the engine is purging all of its air out of there waiting on that thermostat to fully open and get that full coolant flow and burping effect. Not only is that not good for your engine, but it can also avoid your warranty before you ever get on the road. You see these little discs back here? These, these are warranty void discs on the back side of the cylinder heads. Now, once the engine overheats, it will actually melt the center of that disc and it will stay that way. And that's how the engine manufacturer knows you overheated and abused their engine. They're not gonna warranty anything. So in order to avoid that, what you wanna do is vacuum fill the cooling system. Or if you don't wanna buy a vacuum filler tool, what we can do, I'll show you later, is we can fill directly into each side, each bank of the engine with coolant through these ports right here before ever putting the intake manifold on. And that'll give the engine a chance to kind of burp uh, the coolant out of there, the air out of there on each bank individually before you install the intake and finish completing the cooling system. And then we can just fill from there and monitor temperatures. That is the best way to avoid any kind of hot spots and voiding of the warranty on there. Now, once the engine is just like this, ready to go, go ahead and transfer your engine sling over and mount it up to the valley here, just like that. And then once the engine is off of the stand, hanging in the air, we can go ahead and transfer 
uh, the flex plate in the back side here and the spacer plate, very important. So what you wanna do is pull off the old one. I use an impact, pull them off. The bolts are reusable. You use some blue Loctite going back together. And then on the new engine, when you transfer it over, you simply tighten them in a crisscross pattern to 60 foot pounds, okay? Make sure the spacer plate is on there first though and that your dowel pins are in place. Good, quick visual, make sure they line up on there. Dowel pins are super, super important to line up the engine to the transmission and have no problems with cracked flex plates in the future. Besides that, let's hook up the engine crane and get this thing in. At this point, the engine is ready to go back into the vehicle, so let's walk over and make sure the engine compartment is ready to accept the new engine. First thing you want to do is get some good lighting in here on both sides. It's going to help a lot when we're installing and lining things up. And then you want to look around, make sure all the harnesses and lines are tucked out of the way so nothing is in our way when we're trying to set this new engine in here without damaging anything. Think about it. It's going to be really tight coming through right here. Then once we get down far enough, we need to concentrate on lining up the engine mounts with the frame here on both sides, the exhaust on both sides, and the transmission all at the same time. Yeah, so you want everything out of your way. Now, you wanna make sure you pull your rags off your exhaust collectors and clean them up, just like so. This will make sure there's a nice leak-free connection to the new exhaust manifolds we put on. Transmission, make sure it's as far back as possible and as high up as possible in the transmission tunnel. So that is out of the way while we're putting the new engine back into here. Um, the outer part, the mating flange, on mine had a lot of rush transfer from the steel separator plates uh, over on the engine there. A few high spots. So I wanted to clean them off with a disc. I cleaned them off and then I put a little bit of nickel anti-seize on there so it wouldn't have any issues with galvanic corrosion again. I suggest to do the same on yours. Torque converter. Make sure that your, your dot you placed is facing down so we can line it up with the flex plate. Uh, make sure a torque converter is fully inserted into the transmission. Sometimes when you're pulling an engine out, it can hang up on these studs and pull it out a little bit, and then it won't go back in properly. Uh, it won't mount up properly with the engine. So you want to make sure you spin it by hand and push into the transmission. A little jiggle, and do it 10, 15 times. Make sure it fully drops into there, and it's set within the transmission. Then put a little bit of grease on your center pilot hub there. It's very important. And the other things I want to go over are just a few things that um, I change out or take care of while it's all open like this. This is the time. It hasn't been open like this in, what, 10, 15 years. So what I did is I went through and did a little rust remediation, a few spots I painted and, and sealed up on here. The rest of it, you can see all this on here. It's all fluid film. I changed out the lower steering shaft. Mine was loose. A lot of times they bind up. Super easy to change it now. Um, the vent hose for the uh, the front axle on here was split down in here. So if you went, went through any kind of water, it would just suck in, wa in water right away. So I made sure I cut that back a little bit and reinserted it. And I pulled the line down a little bit so there's enough slack. And then over here, even the... Um, the clamping on there where it holds up the vent from the factory was a little too tight, so I released it a few notches on there so it can vent better. Um, but my trans lines were leaking up here, uh, so I changed the whole trans cooler lines while it's out. makes it a lot easier. Uh, you're going to see all the rust remediation I did, make it real nice uh, while it's all apart in here. Um, Power steering lines, another area where they rust a big time and they're a real pain to change, especially when they get stuck in the rack down here. So right now is a good time to take care of that. On the front diff, it was never, the fluid wasn't changed for 130,000 miles. So I popped the cover off on there, cleaned that up and painted it. And then of course, let the uh, differential drain out and wiped it out and did it right. Uh, because you can access that bolt, that bolt, and then the, the rear bolt on there and kind of drop it down far enough to get that front cover off. Um, what else did I do? Um, there's spots on this, this trans harness. It comes up and over the trans, and then it goes just above the exhaust, and it comes up and over a valve cover. Right about here, you'll see it's all disintegrated um, or falling apart, and it exposes the wires so they can chafe and cause a lot of transmission electrical problems. So I put up... Um, 
Uh, they call it friction tape on there the whole length of the way and I covered it with electrical tape after that and that makes sure the harness is good to go because that's near impossible to get to once all this is back in here. Um, what else? Just certain things like this. I put the anti-seize on there. It's a steel uh, hinge going to aluminum hood. Um, same thing down here, anti-seize where those mounts are going to be jiggling around in there. Um, just get a lot of these different areas in here all taken care of uh, while it's all apart like this. That's the way to do it. Clean the degas bottle out real good. You know, all that good stuff. Um, oh, the other thing I did, because it's really easy right now, is these are the vacuum lines right here that go down to the IWE system. There's a lot of points for breakage on here. So what I did is I did a vacuum test while it's all apart from right up here where it stops and make sure the integrity of the lines in the IWE system is fully intact. So there's a lot you can do while it's all apart like this, and it's a good idea to do. Enough of that. Let's start lowering the engine into the vehicle and get this thing out of here. And now it's time to finally put the engine in. Alex, my son here, is going to help me. He just got his license today. Congratulations, Alex. Um, so we're going to go ahead and get this engine in finally. Make sure you bring it over nice and safe and all your chains are secure. Get it up and into place just like mine is. And then once we start getting it down into the vehicle is when the magic starts to happen. So let's go ahead and start uh, putting it into the vehicle. The same thing, you're going to watch up front here and you're going to watch back here. That's why it's nice to have a helper uh, to crank it and lower it uh, while you're kind of guiding it in. So initially what we're going to do is we're going to get it nice and straight. Even though this thing's at an angle, the engine is straight. Then we need to do like a pre-position it. Get it as close as possible before we start dropping it in. We got like six inches back here. Um, and this is key to making sure you don't damage anything. Now we're close enough, we can start dropping it. So just turn it lightly. It's gonna drop a lot. And be very careful over here when you're turning the release screw. Just a little bit, just like that. See how it is right there? It's going down, you can see it's going down. Tighten. Now we're, going, we're coming too close to the back here because of the boom's coming down. So yank it out a little bit. A little more. We're gonna come down and back. A little bit more. Right there, now continue lowering it. And then just concentrate on lowering it into the vehicle without damaging the engine or the body. Slowly. Pull four a little more, stop it. Stop, 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 stop. You don't want to do that. Go ahead and stop it. Back up. What you need to do is pull it forward. So you'll hit the harness back there. This up here is just magnesium, so it's not really gonna hurt anything. Back here, it's all painted and there's harnesses, so be careful back there. Now at this point, we're clear of the course port and back here, so now you really can't damage anything. We wanna go down a little bit further, to clear the top of the wiper cowl, and then you can start pushing it back and getting in position. But, uh, everything looks good. Keep going down a little bit. A little bit. Slower though. That's good. Down, down, down. Uh, stop. So when the engine gets right above the, the two mounts in the, in the frame for the, the engine mounts, once it gets right above them and we're down pretty far like this, that's when you can start scooting it back and you get it to, uh, back towards the trans and we start dropping it more. Hopefully it'll fall right into those mounts in there. What I'm gonna do now, hopefully this room, is bring it closer so you can kind of look down in here and see exactly what's going on. All right, so that's probably as close as I can get you. You can see we're still really far away from the trans, uh, but we're hovering right above those, those, those mounts in the frame. So we're ready to push back now. Still watch, we have fuel lines, evap lines over here and all that stuff. You wanna start centering it in the engine bay too because we're gonna start hitting stuff. Uh, are pretty darn centered in this one, maybe over to the left just a little bit. All right, let's push it back a little bit, into there a little more. Just 
like a game of Tetris at this point, fitting this thing in here. What you need to realize is um, the oil pan is sitting right above the front axle right now, so you really can't drop it down anymore. You need to get it centered, push back, and cleared of that axle uh, so the pan will clear, and then we can start dropping it down into the mounts. All right, push back. Now we're gonna get it close to the firewall. Close to pop. Keep hitting on the bottom. Just hit it. Just watch your lines there. So here's how it's going to look at this point of uh, the install. Remember, I'm going through all these details because a lot of people that are doing this engine swap have done, are doing it for the first time. Uh, so there's a lot of key points here. So you can see how far back we are uh, to the firewall here. We're very close. Nowhere near the trans yet. Nowhere near the exhaust down there. But down below here... If I can get you down in here, you can see the oil pan is now basically clear of the front axle. So now we can start dropping it down and moving it back as we're dropping it down to fit right into the frame there. You see how it works? So it's just like a kind of like, like, a, like a Tetris game, I guess. You, you kind of move it, move it, move it, and, you know, it just kind of falls into place. Just keep watching stuff so you don't damage anything while you're doing it. All right. Um, so start lowering a little bit. Turn it very slowly. What we'll do is we'll get it closer and closer to the frame. Now that we're clear of the front axle, we're still not fighting the trans yet because it's pushed back far enough. So now stop right there. Right now we're right above those, those pockets in the frame for the, uh, for the engine mount. So this one will kind of fall in place, has some wiggle room, uh, whereas this side's like that big donut on the side. So you gotta fit it in there perfectly like a roll restrictor almost. So this side is the side you want to concentrate at this point, getting it in there. So right now I'm lined up on this side, or concentrating on this side, because this engine mount's harder to get into. So lower a little bit, very slow. And this is where the lights come into play here. You want to get down there and see what the heck you're doing, because this one over here is a really tight fit. All right, stop. See, now we're, we're putting it into that mount over here, uh, but we're close back here on these lines. It's a hard metal line right here, so it's not a big deal, but it's something to be mindful of. All right. Lift it a little bit. That's it. There we go. See that side? This side right here was right on top of it, lined up though, um, but it was it was right there. So just lift it a little bit so it'll go over and it'll fall into place. Now this one's kind of locked in over here. Now we can go back to the other side and kind of do the same thing, but the other side here um, is more forgiving. It's just two studs sticking through the frame on there. So the other side should basically stay at this point. You don't want to raise it really. Oh, see, you get to that certain point there where there's enough friction, it won't pop out, yet you can still move it easily so you can kind of drop into these mount points on here. So right now it's in the pocket over here. I gotta make sure it's still good to go over here. And it is, it's perfectly in there. Now it's time to go um, underneath and try to start lining up the exhaust and the a transmission down there. Here's a better view of what's going on underneath that I couldn't show you earlier. So like I said, at first, once you get it down and into the pocket here, where you're dangling just above uh, these mounts in the frame, your engine mounts will be dangling right above it. You wanna concentrate on this side, the driver's side mount. It's like a big donut roll restrictor. We saw it earlier when we put it on. It fits in there really tight both sides and uh, it'll line up the hole there perfectly when it's fully seated. And also, there's a pin underneath here that sticks through, help align that side too. So that side's the hard side to align. So do that first. And then you can come on this side to the passenger side and you know, kind of get that mount within the uh, frame mount here, just kind of in that pocket. And then you usually have to push it back a little bit and jostle around a little bit, and it'll fall right into those two slots right there, okay? Your engine mount and the passenger side is gonna vary. It'd be two big nuts on that side, one big, one small. 
I think the newest ones, 09 and newer, have a more restrict around this side type looking mount uh, that are also hard to get into. It's very tight. So once those are in there and they're kind of, they're aligned, okay? What you wanna do next is go after the exhaust. So this is gonna be close, just like this. My stud, my lower stud was sticking into the cat converter. So while it's up in the air and the weight's off of it, it's kind of dangling there, you can easily reach up in here, pull the exhaust down, just kind of hang on it, and then pull the engine down a little bit, and it'll dangle this way a little bit, and it'll fall outside the pipe. And you let everything go, and it's kind of sitting just like this. You can put this on anytime later on. But at least they're aligned and the studs aren't in there. This side's even easier. It's just kind of straight down type deal. So you can do this one at any time, uh, as long as the pipe is not sticking into one of these studs getting hung up. All right, now that my transmission is being supported, I want to take a second to go through in detail and help you guys with the transmission to engine alignment. This is the part where a lot of guys get hung up and they get frustrated and they start jamming the bolts down. They don't know what they're doing and they end up ruining either the transmission or the torque converter. It's, it's a process. You need to do it and you need to do it right. So let's go over. Now again, the engine's in, it's sitting in its engine mounts free. There's no bolts or nuts in them so it can move around a little bit, perfect. At this point, we're gonna take the transmission and we're gonna use the trans jack or regular jack in a block of wood across the front right here. And we're just gonna support the trans. Okay, so that's some support to it. Then we're gonna go back here in the, the, the transmission cross member and we're gonna use these two studs inside of here and a pry bar and we're gonna press forward. We're gonna pry forward and we're gonna drag the transmission closer to the engine, okay? We're gonna get it close but not touching, okay? And then we're gonna use the bell housing here to our advantage. You can use it, press up, press down, whatever you gotta do, pull down and get it aligned enough so you can get one of the bell housing bolts in, like you see this one right here. That's the first one that came into play for me. So I got this one in a couple threads by hand. It's not tightened at all. It's just supporting and aligning that side of the transmission. Now come to the other side of the bell housing here, and you're gonna do the same exact thing, but you can see the driver's side is much easier to get to all these bolts on here. So these two are shorter, and that top one for the trans cable is a little bit longer. Again, you're gonna get it aligned, you're gonna push and pull on the bell housing as needed, and then you can just get them in a couple threads by hand. That helps align and support it. Now the very top one on here is the, the dowels on both sides. So you can see mine's lined up and we're pushed onto the dowels a little bit. So it's supporting and aligning the transmission perfectly at this point, yet it's still loose enough to uh, get the rest of it lined up. And the most important part next, once it's supported and partially aligned, we need to align the torque converter stud so it sticks through the flex plate on here. We marked it earlier with, with the white paint for balance. Now we need to make sure that stud comes through. With the transmission aligned to the engine array with the dowel pins, once you get this stud aligned and it pops through, all the rest of them will line up and pop through also, all at the same time, okay? So like I said, you can use a small flat blade screwdriver to kind of move it in here and, and get it so it pops through. You can at least see it, because right now you can't see it at all. Or, come on this side, for transmissions that still have the rubber plug right here, you can see the stud is inside of there. So the stud is right there, it's close, it's not perfect, but we pre-positioned it earlier so it would be close just like this. So at this point, it makes it really easy with this plug on here. Close, we're touching the flex plate, but we're not jammed against it right now because the bolts are all loose, okay? So pull back a little bit. So at this point, what you wanna do is just either pry on the, the uh, torque converter, or in this case, it's so easy, it's right here. Right there, you see that right there? Now at this point, we are in a perfect position because once it came through and we're lined up over here, this torque converter was able to move. You can see it, it's moving really nice. So come back on this side. You see it right there? It's coming through. We're lined up at this point. We just need to bring the trans forward once again. So I'll go back there and I'll pry on those, those studs again. So you stay there and check it out. Bring it forward just a little bit more, okay? 
See that? You see how it can, it can still move? We're not binding at all. So make sure you pry evenly on both sides. Okay. We're into our witness marks. We are fully forward at this point. All right. We're right against the, the, trans, or the engine there. Now the final test, once the, the trans is fully forward and against the, um, the engine, you stick your finger in here or just grab that stud and you move back and forth. It should be moving nice and free like that. It should not be binding at all, okay? So at this point, we're, we're, all four studs are through and we're aligned with the dowel pins on the side of the transmission. You're free to go ahead and start tightening all the bell housing bolts to 35 foot-pounds uh, to suck it fully to the engine. And then again, at the end, you wanna grab that stud and just move it a little bit. Just make a nice little pinging sound. So it'll be nice and free inside there, lined up and not binding. That is the way to do it. It's a process, a little here, a little there, and you'll get them together without ruining anything. And that's key here. At this point, with the transmission fully aligned and bolted up down below here, we can do one final check of that torque converter to make sure it's aligned and not binding in any way. So what you wanna do is just get, stick your finger through the hole down here, or just grab that stud, and just wiggle it back and forth. Should sound just like that. That tells us it's aligned, it's centered in there, and none of the four studs are binding in any way. It's absolutely perfect. So we're good to go. We can go ahead and put our torque converter nuts on there, use some blue Loctite, torque them down to 27 foot-pounds, do one right here, go to the next one, and the next one, the same way you took them off. Okay, get those ones set before you forget. It's very easy to forget those. Go ahead and put your inspection plate back on here, your plug back on here, okay? And then you can even go ahead and start putting these miscellaneous items on like the starter, bolt up the starter, get it wired in while it's all open like this. And then you can go ahead and start uh, bolting down your engine, okay? The through bolt there and the two nuts on this side. Now the torque specs on these do vary throughout the years different designs, so I'll put that information down below, but you're, you're set, you're ready to go and start you know, tightening down the engine mounts at this point. And then right after that, torque down the two nuts right here for the transmission mount, 76 foot pounds. And then we can come on this side here, get our transmission shift linkage back down and hooked in right there, and then bolt it in right here, and then just go ahead and snap it onto the manual shaft on there. Um, the exhaust, now is a good time to get the studs and the, the flanges lined up for the exhaust on here for your, your, um, your downpipe on here. What you wanna do is go ahead and put both nuts on their finger tight and then just kind of tighten it evenly side to side and even side to side because this whole Y-pipe uh, cat converter system is, is an assembly at this point. So you wanna do it evenly both sides and now make sure you have a leak-free connection. So go ahead and take care of that. Um, also the front drive shaft, you can go ahead and pop that on all four bolts. Again, Loctite, 76 foot pounds. And the same thing back here with the rear drive shaft. Go ahead and get it, uh, go ahead and stick it into the transfer case. And then back here, bolt it in all four bolts. Make sure you line up your mark on there. Again, blue Loctite, 76 foot pounds. All this miscellaneous items down here and in the back of the vehicle, we can take care of all this stuff right now. Uh, and then we'll go up and just concentrate on the engine at that point, okay? So just kind of look around and look at all the stuff you took off and just start bolting it back on. Back up top here, the very first thing you wanna do is take care of a few items that are buried way back down inside the engine here. So you have the two remaining bell housing bolts up top here. I'm gonna get those in right away. And then take your vent hose right there and clip it onto this bracket. And then before we lay this trans harness across the back here and up and around the head, you first wanna install this heater tube right here. It comes down, wraps around to the engine valley, and then it slips right onto the back side of the water pump onto this nipple right here. Should be two new O-rings on there. It slips right on. And the back side of the head back there, it'll actually bolt up. There's a little bracket on the tube and it'll bolt up to the head back there. Now this is a studded bolt right here that you're supposed to use on there. So go ahead and bolt that up. 
And then right away after that, while you still have access, you wanna go ahead and put this braided strap onto there. So this end goes onto the body side. So go ahead and put that in there. And then the other end of it, the eyelet almost always breaks off from rust and corrosion while you're taking everything apart. Uh, and it happened on this one, sure enough. So what I do is I open up the braid on there and you stick it right through the stud on there. Uh, that, that's back there now from the heater tube. And then you put the 10 mil nut and it completes the ground path perfectly fine that way. And you can reuse that strap that way. So go ahead and take care of those items. And once all that's together, you can of course finish laying the, the trans harness all the way across up and around the head. And I'll just sit there waiting for the PCM here eventually. At this point also, you can go ahead and bolt up your, your trans dipstick tube on the side here and you know pop in your um, AC compressor, the three bolts over here, go ahead and take care of that. Your power steering pump, go ahead and bolt that to the side over here. You can start taking care of all these miscellaneous items so you can start getting the engine back together. All these lower end ones down here. You can even do some over here. And then we'll come back and we'll, I'll show you in detail how to install the intake on here because it's critical. Uh, to install it correctly. Next, we are going to be installing the intake manifold. But first, you wanna make sure the engine and the engine compartment as a whole here is ready to accept it. It's a big component going back in here and it's gonna block a lot of access back here. So you wanna make sure all your installation items in the backside of the engine are complete. So at this point, your engine compartment should look a little something like this. You know, everything is kind of laid back in, all these miscellaneous items. So you wanna make sure your engine harness is on top of the valve covers nice and loose. There are two connections to the upstream O2 sensors, one each side that you can access through the engine valley here. You wanna make those connections now. They're deep down in there, but they're a lot easier to access through the engine valley before the intake goes on. Also, I dropped in the uh, AC compressor, power steering pump, got all that in. Um, I installed the radiator, popped in the trans cooler lines, and the lower radiator hose got that all complete. The hose going up to the degas pile got that all clamped off, so that's all sealed off. And just kind of getting all these miscellaneous items in place and done. Uh, so we can go ahead and install the intake. Now installing the intake can be a bit of a pain because of these three connections right here. The two knock sensors and the CHT sensor that go back up and through the IMRC rods a certain way. And I'll show a clip at the end of this on exactly how to do that. So you don't uh, wrap them around the rods and bind them up. You don't want to do that. Now, like I said earlier, this engine is shipped dry, just like any other engine. And it's best, if you're not vacuum filling it, to go ahead and fill the water jacket on both sides right now. So you can go ahead and just kind of pour into the ports right here with um, a funnel. Be careful, you don't want to get down any down in the intake port of the head here. And just kind of fill both sides so you can start seeing it pull up inside there. You don't need to fill it to the very top, but just to you can start seeing it come up in there and it's kind of burped out. So each bank of the engine has this coolant kind of flowing around in there, okay? And we can get rid of some of, the, some of those uh, air pockets that are inside of there. Uh, besides that, you want to make sure your water crossover is ready to go. All clean up like this. And we can drop on our two new gaskets. They just kind of push in. They snap in on here. Same thing with the intake manifold. You wanna make sure it's cleaned up, make sure there's no carbon on your injector tips, and then the new intake gasket snap to the intake on this design. Um, I also put on the brake vacuum hose on the backside of the intake now, get it on there in position, and it'll make it so much easier dropping it all in together um, later on, because otherwise it's a real pain to push that onto there when the intake's in place, trust me. Um, so yeah, at this point, if everything's cleaned up and ready to go, we can go ahead and remove uh, the covering, the cardboard cover on the intake ports on here. Make sure the uh, gasket surface is clean. And then I like to blow some compressed air down into those intake ports to make sure there's no debris lodged down in them. Let's get to it. All right, here we go. Now the whole process this is gonna be a lot of back and forth on here, so. We just have to move it a little bit at a time, and we'll eventually get it in there. We're gonna drop it down initially. First thing you're gonna fight is this brake booster hose. So I'm gonna get mine in place. Just use the fuel rails to kind of use like handles. So we'll get it back far enough 
time I get my line and bracket, because it's an 04, we're gonna get it down and over into place on here. And we'll get that taken care of first. So you can drop it down a little bit and get it out of our way. There we go. Now that's out of our way. We can continue to move the intake back a little bit further, okay? Straighten the booster line a little bit. He's kind of get to a point where you get far enough back like that, and then we're gonna start all the connections, the electrical connections through the back. And you can kind of reach around and see most of this, a little bit of it, but most of it's gonna be by feel. So in order to illustrate this properly, because it is so important, let's cut to a clip of how to route the wires back there so you do it and do it right. Here's a really good view of how this procedure is going to look. The reason why I'm doing it now while the engine's in the stand is because it's impossible to see back there, impossible to film back there, and most of this can be done by feel. So you want a good reference of what's going on back here when you're installing the intake. So once the engine's in the vehicle and you have the main engine harness laid down on both valve covers, kind of in place loose, and you're starting to install the intake and you're starting to slide it back into there, don't bring it all the way back to its resting position just yet. You want to get it far enough back that you can attach the main engine harness right here to the stud. So you find a metal tab, kind of get it located on there, and then put the nut on there just a few turns loose so that the whole harness is still loose back here, but it's located. And that's going to help us make our three critical connections back here from the engine valley. Now the problem, the mistake a lot of technicians make with this intake, because it is so big and bulky, and it's harder to see back here and get back here, is they take all these connections from the, the engine valley here and just wrap them up around and connect them in the best they can, whatever. The problem with that is that these IMRC rods back here will get all bound up, all this linkage will get all bound up on the engine harness and cause IMRC codes, and then you're pulling it back off once again. So you wanna make sure everything's routed properly. So once this thing's located right here, and we have it far enough back so it can't fall off, we're gonna concentrate on the three connections from the engine valley. So we're gonna take the driver's side knock sensor. You can see it coming up through there. It's gonna come up and go behind the harness right here. The reason why I'm doing this again, it's because you're gonna be doing all this by feel. Uh, the passenger side knock sensor comes up, goes up and over to right there. Make sure all these connections click so they're secure. And then we'll take the CHT sensor, we'll take the jumper, up again all the stuff is on the inside of the rods here and it goes over and clips right in okay same thing with the imrc motor itself it comes down from the main harness right here a little pigtail and it clips right in that is key to making sure all this stuff does not interfere with the imrc rods very very critical you could do all this while it's up and out of there you know six eight inches away from its final resting place the other critical item back here, which is a real pain, is the darn vacuum booster tube that feeds the brake booster. It's very important that gets put on this little nipple back here properly. Now, in the 04 models, the bracket, the tube, all that stuff is one piece, okay? You want to take it, you want to push it all the way onto the nipple of the intake. It's way down in there. Push it all the way onto it and make sure it's secure. And then you're going to take the intake and everything and put it on together. Later on, from down below, you can take the bracket, line it up with the screw hole on there, and then mount it up, and then the O4s just dangle from that point on out over to the booster. Now, in the O5 and newer models, there's going to be a big old elbow like this. This is the newest style right here with all these clamps on it. And this one's big and beefy. And this one, same thing. It goes on there, push it on all the way. And then right here will be a, a tube that comes down and it snaps into a bracket right here. It's already mounted to the head. So again, you want to keep this bracket mounted to the head, leave it there in place. But when you're putting the intake on, you want to take this 90 degree elbow right here, the tube, the metal tube that goes up and over and feeds everything. And you want to take it all together with the intake and plop it down into place, okay? It's going to be a pain to get this back down in there, but that's the way to do it. You don't want to do it afterwards trying to get it on there. It's too tight and it's impossible with the firewall being in the way. You want to do it while you're putting the intake on. And then after that, again, you can snap it into your bracket and then feed it on off from there. Those are the critical points back here, the connections you want to make, and you want to make them properly so there's no issues afterwards. Then after that, everything is out here in the open. 
And just like that, the intake's in. It takes a little bit of finesse, working it in a little bit, moving the vacuum tube, moving the harness, moving in a little bit more, dropping it down fully. And then after that, like it is right now, you wanna make sure that there's nothing trapped underneath it. Any harness pieces, um, any vacuum tubes, I mean, there's this vacuum line, the 04 models that goes back here. So you wanna look at it carefully, carefully with a flashlight at the gasket on here where the gasket meets the cylinder head. It should be flush all the way around. There's no rocking of the boat, I guess you could say. It should just sit there perfect on the cylinder heads, ready to go. Uh, so make sure that's okay all the way around and recheck, double check, triple check your harness routing back here. You can kind of feel for it and make sure it's inside the IMRC rods and everything's good to go. The main harness coming back and around here. And then of course your vacuum tube, it's out, out of the way and kind of in place for right now. So at this point we can start uh, actually bolting the intake on. So we're gonna grab our water crossover, okay? Remember it slips underneath it over here. So this is why it's still loose. So we're gonna kind of get it in here and then just lift the intake and get it in here, just like that. Now the first thing you wanna do is bolt in the, um, the water crossover first because this bolt right here, the same one we took out earlier, it's gonna be hard to get to, if not impossible to get to, once the intake is down and in place. So do the three bolts for the water crossover, the little eight mil bolts, and then you can go ahead and get all your intake bolts and start putting them in all the way around. You wanna use an extension, a 10 mil, and kind of thread them in by hand, a couple of threads, to make sure we're not cross-threading because we want the torque to be even and, and um, correct when we're, when we're torquing down a plastic intake like this so it has no vacuum leaks over any temperature range. So once all of these are torqued in place, you can go ahead and start, you know, just putting your, your thermostat in here, your water neck, bolting that down. You can get your alternator, just throw it right back into here, two bolts here and the bolts up here for the bracket for it, all that kind of stuff. You can drop the coils back in and, um, you know, bolt them in and then start doing all your connections for the, um, for all the coils and the injectors and all that stuff, all different sensors on the engine here. And then don't forget your, your fuel line here. Mine's tucked behind. I put a little bit of grease in these O-rings on the fuel line connection and then make sure you put it on there until it snaps. You'll hear a loud clicking noise, which means it's fully secured in there. And then of course, put your uh, secondary lock on there. So yeah, at this point, it's, it's pretty simple. I'll put the torque specs in the sequence for the intake manifold. I'll link to the PDF for that down below so you guys can print it out. It's sitting right here and you can torque it and torque it right. So yeah, just go ahead and torque that down then start getting all the small stuff around it on. As you can imagine, once that intake goes back on and it's torqued in sequence and set in place, everything else, you know, just kind of uh, lays in around it and you just start making all your connections. I mean, the rest of your harness connections, your battery connections over here, uh, the rest of your heater hoses and all that stuff, it all kind of just falls into place once the intake's on there. PCM, air box, your PCV lines over here, canister purge, uh, all those connections, just go through and put everything back that you took off when we pulled the engine out. It all basically falls into place. You know, your front end accessory drive components on there, all that stuff. So it's nice and complete. Now, when I go to fire a new engine like this, I will not put on the fan and the fan shroud as of yet. I want to keep it open. I want to look around and get a good visual while the engine's idling initially, okay? So at this point, the engine is all back together, okay? Everything's back together the way it should be besides the fan and shroud. Uh, so we'll go ahead and connect the negative battery cable. It's safe now. And then we're gonna go ahead and start filling all the fluids. So make sure all your drain plugs and drain cocks and the alternator, alternator, <laughs> the radiator and uh, the oil pan and all that stuff, make sure they're all tight because we're gonna start filling fluids. So what you wanna do with the engine is start off with eight quarts. It's probably gonna take closer to nine. Uh, but start off at eight quarts because the engine's dry, remember, okay? Power steering, if you did disconnect your lines or replace some lines at the pump like I had to, you want to go ahead and you want to overfill that reservoir on there. Mine, I had to fill a bit yet because it's set overnight. 
uh, but you want to overfill it because initially it's gonna suck it way down and you don't want it starving your pump um, the other thing is coolant of course now if you don't have that vacuum filler you should have already filled each bank on the engine like I showed earlier just to get an initial burping of the actual base block uh, and at, at this point with everything back, to, back together you can of course start filling over here at the degas bottle just fill it all the way to the top it'll just continually burp out through this line over here the rest of the way I'm going to vacuum fill mine of course um, yeah so just get everything all the fluids back in there you know your engine oil and your coolant basically and of course your power steering and uh, we'll go ahead and fire it up. Now on mine, I had I replaced the dipstick tube on the transmission, so I also need to make sure I fill that transmission fluid back up because I probably lost two or three quarts by pulling that tube out of there. Uh, so if you did that and you leaked from the transmission, don't forget about that. You don't want to burn the transmission next. So you want to check all your fluids when you're doing an engine job like this afterwards because stuff does leak out. So let's go ahead and fill the fluids up, connect the negative battery terminal, and then we'll start the priming process on the engine. All right, now, with our negative battery cable connected and secure, our initial fill of all the fluids in the engine compartment done, the next thing we're gonna do is we're going to prime the engine. So we get oil throughout the engine and we pressurize all the circuits in there, including the chain tensioners, before we ever fire the engine. That's the idea here. So the way you do that is you disable the injectors and the coils by coming down here in the front of the engine next to the AC compressor and leaving the crankshaft position sensor disconnected. So just disconnect it if you connected it already. Leave it off to the side away from the belt drive here so it doesn't get caught up in it. And then we're going to simply go over to the driver's seat and just crank away on the engine until we see oil pressure in the cluster in there. Now what, what you want to do is make sure you have a good a good battery or a battery charger on the battery. We're going to crank it for about 15 to 30 seconds at a time, allowing the starter to cool for two to three minutes in between sessions, and then do it again, another 15 to 30 seconds of cranking until we get oil pressure. Once we get oil pressure, you want to crank it for another 10 to 15 seconds to make sure we fill all the circuits in there, okay? And we really pressurize the entire engine and get flow going before we fire it. So let's go ahead and do that. All right, here we go. Moment of truth. Now we're going to listen for a lot of different things when we're cranking the engine to build this oil pressure. So like I said, we're going to crank it for 15 to 30 seconds at a time, looking for this oil pressure to come up on here. Remember, it's just a switch down below. It's a dummy gauge. So when it hits 7 to 10 PSI, it's going to go full middle on here. That's not full pressure. So once it hits and it pops up on here and shows pressure, you want to crank for another 10 to 15 seconds to really get the engine uh, full of oil and pressurized in there, especially the chain tensioners. So when you're cranking, you also want to listen to make sure you have a nice, even cranking sound to the engine. So let's go ahead and start that now. Nice, even cranking. That gives you a general sense of the overall mechanical condition of the engine. Now, being a brand new engine, it really shouldn't take too long to build oil pressure. It is dry, uh, but all the clearances are nice and tight. So again, you know, 15, 30 seconds if you want to push it, and then let that starter cool. Very important. All right, go ahead and turn the key off. Let the starter cool. Now, at this point, you know, we've been cranking the engine, right? So we can get out of the vehicle here and fall over while the starter's cooling you can come over here and check your your power steering reservoir because we're cranking and we're turning that pump down there and it's kind of bleeding air out and pressurizing and filling the passages in the power steering system so you can recheck that and just kind of check the overall condition make sure the belt you know is tracking on there all that kind of stuff uh while we're waiting for the starter to cool you know, may check your coolant level, stuff like that. Mine's vacuum filled, so it's perfect. Uh, and just let it cool. It's very important to let the starter cool before you burn it out. And then after three, four crank sessions, you should get something like this, where you start to crank it. And you get oil pressure. Again, once it peaks like that, comes up, 10, 15 seconds. You wanna get the oil lubricating inside of there and pressurizing 
especially the chain tensioners. All right, that's probably good enough. We're good to go. We're holding pressure still, actually. Uh, so we can go ahead and connect that crank sensor and fire the engine. All right, let's fire this puppy up. Now, at first, you may hear a little bit of uh, startup rattle from the chain tensioners or even the hydraulic lash adjusters. Remember, everything's new in here. We're filling the hydraulic circuits for the oil, and everything's pumping up. So don't worry about it if you hear a little bit of rattle upon the initial startup. Um, after that, you want to let it run for 5, 10, 15 seconds. Then we'll shut it down and immediately check our fluids. You know, check for leaks. And, of course, check our oil level. Make sure oil level is proper and before we're letting it run any further. All right, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Sounds good. Like I said, at first, I leave the fan and the shroud off of here so you can get access to everything and check it over. You may also hear this right here. That's the alternator basically screaming, recharging the battery from all that cranking we just did. So don't worry about that either. All right, shut it off. Now it's time to check that oil level, make sure it's in spec. All right, so sure enough, at eight quarts, the oil level is perfect on there. I looked around, there's no leaks, and of course the belts aren't shredding or anything weird like that. No weird noises. So at this point, we can go ahead and just start it up. We're gonna let it idle and let the, let the hydraulic lash adjusters fill and pressurize uh, fully. And then we're also going to allow the electronic throttle body to learn its rest or idle position to keep the idle it needs and wants on there based on the conditions. So that's all a very important uh, part of the learning process when everything is new like this. So let's let it idle. And while you're doing that, you know, kind of look over, make sure nothing's leaking, check your fluid level, stuff like that. And we're actually gonna start installing all these cowl pieces back on up here um, so that we can get all that back together and finally put the hood on. The hood goes back on the same way you took it off to be very, very careful with it. Um, and then line up those marks you made earlier, snap on the, the power assist struts and it'll hold and that'll be done. It's a pretty quick process, pretty light. So, yep. Um, I do let the engine fully warm up without the fan and the fan shroud. I know you guys are probably wondering. Yes, I let the engine warm up to full operating temp initially with the fan and the shroud off. Uh, after that, we can shut it down. We can look around, make sure there's no leaks, nothing coming apart, everything sounds good. And then we can go ahead and let it cool for a little bit and finally put the fan and the shroud on. Again, it goes on the same way you took it off. Um, if you're using hand tools to put that hub nut back on to the water pump, um, once you get it tightened by hand, it'll, it'll spin on by hand all the way to the end there. Once you get to that point, either use a pneumatic like I use or just a, a fan clutch, um, a fan hub nut wrench. Um, you simply put it on there, right? And then you take a hammer and you tap it up here and that'll make sure it's tight enough on there. It's not gonna come loose. No need for Loctite on there. And then that'll complete it. At that point, hood on, fan on, you can go for a test drive and see how this puppy purrs. All right, so it's finally done. Engine's back in, vehicle runs great. Uh, no problems with it at all. I'm very happy with it. It's been about six months now. Um, so hopefully this video was enough, had enough detail to it uh, to help you guys get through on your own. Um, there's a lot of experience and a lot of detail, a lot of tips and tricks in this video. That's why it was so long. Uh, but I think it's helped a lot of you out there change your engine yourself. And that's the whole point of this channel, helping you fix your Ford yourself. See you next time, guys.